Hello, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here today. And I'd like to thank the organizers myself and to thank Sinto for being my host and Shirley for doing such a wonderful job in organizing this uh, conference. And it's just my pleasure to be here. And I want you to know that while I have done a great deal of work teaching mindfulness to children and training adults in teaching mindfulness to children, I view this trip here as one of my listening as much as my teaching. I'm very interested in hearing what you have to say. I'm very interested in hearing your experiences. And I'm very interested in hearing how together with the different cultural, uh, the cultural differences between the United States and Singapore, maybe we can think of some ways that this, uh, we can work together and share our collective wisdom. So please know that I, I have certainly a great deal of experience in this uh, area, but I don't view myself as uh, the expert who knows everything, and I am very, very interested in hearing what all of you have to say and what I learn over the next week. So we're going to go through these slides relatively quickly, and um, this is just a slide about the Inner Kids program, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we go through. Uh, the Inner Kids program, one of the things we emphasize in the Inner Kids program is the whole child, uh, not just their, the child's academic um, capacity, not just the child's emotional capacity, not the, just the child's physical capacity, but we've learned through research and through experience that by really paying attention to the whole child, we can better help him or her in his overall well-being, as well as in the overall well-being of this entire family system. Um, now, we're getting that one again, sorry. Now, what do we mean when we talk about the whole child? The whole child is, includes the body, so it includes the physicality of the child, but it also includes the mind, and the mind being the brain, the intellect, as well as the emotions, the thoughts and the emotions. And then, of course, without the heart, um, we really don't have the whole picture. And when we're teaching children, we really want not to pay too much atten attention on any one of these areas, not to pay too much attention on the body or on the mind, the intellect, or on the emotions, or on the heart, but actually to work in balance, to create a balanced child who will be able to be happy, who will be able to be compassionate, and as a result, hopefully be able to reach his or her hopes and dreams as, um, as they grow up. Our program is based on the four foundations of mindfulness and mindfulness of in and out breathing. These are traditional Buddhist texts. We track those texts very, very carefully. Um, and as you'll see as we talk a little bit more about the program, it's really quite genius how those programs are dovetailing with the new scientific research that's coming out. Now that being said, even though our program does closely track uh, these traditional texts, our program is entirely secular. It's something we've been extremely careful about doing. We do go into public schools and public community centers, and we teach children of uh, all faiths. So, but most, if not all, major faiths do have some strong contemplative traditions, and so there's common commonality that we can draw upon. And the basic uh, premise where we start is just awareness of inner and outer experience. What we're really teaching kids to do in this program is really build their capacity for awareness. And again, in following the traditional text, we start with awareness of both inner and outer experience. And so as a result, with awareness of inner and outer experience, we develop attention, balance, and compassion. We call these the new ABCs of learning. Uh, we've all probably met children who are really quite extraordinary at paying attention, but maybe they're not very nice. And it's also possible we've met children who are really quite compass compassionate and the sweetest kids in the world, but they have a very hard time paying attention. So what we try to do is we try to give uh, treat the child in front of us, and when we talk about the whole child. We talk about treating the child that's in front of us now. And if the child is uh, very strong in attention but needs a little work in the pro-social skills, then we'll work a little bit more on the practices that benefit the pro-social skills and develop those. If the child is sweet as can be but is having a little bit trouble with attention, then we'll work a little bit more on the attention skills. And as you'll see, there are very highly developed uh, traditions or practices in the tradition that train all of these attention, balance, and compassion. We call these the new ABCs, the new ABCs of learning. We call the attention, balance, and compassion. Now, I wanted to point out the slides that I'm showing you. 
Um, they may seem a little unusual. I don't know if you've seen slides like this before. But this is one of, the, one of the reasons I present with these types of slides, is it's a way of showing you how we try to present with children. In presenting with children, we try to present to learners who are both visual learners, auditory learners, and learners who learn more through reading. So we have all sorts of games, activities, and visual um, and visual presentations so that we are able to reach all different learners even if they may not be traditional learners. The other beauty of this type of uh, presentation is it actually is speaking to a different part of your brain. My words are speaking to one part of your brain which is more of a linear part of your brain but the images are actually speaking to a different part of the brain. Uh, so I've been told by my friends who are researchers. And so you, when you are watching a presentation and hearing a presentation like this, the hope is that that you are getting um, the information in all sorts of different ways and that that will help you and particularly children learn a little bit more easily. So the program is three parts. We start with introspection. Introspection, even as young as four years old, we have been successful in teaching them introspective practices. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. We start with introspection, but when playing introspect, when, uh, when practicing, excuse me, when practicing introspective introspection with kids, it's extremely important that we keep it simple, that we keep it fun, and that we keep our sense of humor. If this is just too difficult for them, if it's too serious, if it's not fun, they're not going to do it and they're not going to get a benefit. But if we keep it lighthearted and if we have fun and if we're realistic about what we can expect from kids, little by little they can build their uh, capacity to attend for longer and lo longer periods of time. As far as the sense of humor, I'm sure all of those out there who work with kids know that that is just critical when we're going in and working with kids in this type of a situation. So first we practice introspection. The next thing that we need to do though is we need to understand what it is that we saw while practicing introspection. And this is a part that is uh, sometimes called counsel process. It's a process where we talk to children about what they experienced. Now please understand that when we talk to kids about what they experience, we don't necessarily get in there. It is not therapy and we don't necessarily get in there and what I say back home is we don't muck around with their problems. What we do do is we bring awareness to their problems and as uh, children become more awareness of what they're experiencing in their minds and their body, then that in and of itself, the awareness in and of itself often brings about change. So this is not a therapy situation. We're often in large groups of children, but that doesn't stop us from being able to really build awareness and help kids learn to build the capacity for awareness in a safe environment. So then we have the awareness training and then lastly is community service because from the, uh, from the standpoint of the teachers' teachings in which I was taught, uh, all that we learn while through introspection is extremely helpful, but we uh, bringing with it an attitude of service to others, bringing it out into the community, generosity is also extremely important. So it's a, it's an integral part of our program. Now that I think you already saw, so I'm going to just go to the next one. So the first thing we start with is awareness of inner experience. And this, again, is if you're familiar with the four foundations of mindfulness or mindfulness of in and out breathing, you'll see that this is, tracks it pretty closely. We start with breath and body awareness. This little guy, or our gender neutral uh, little person there, is one of the uh, characters we use with the kids. And you'll be surprised how many arguments the kids get into about whether he or she is a boy or a girl. But these are the kind of things that make it a great deal of fun for them. So we start with breath and body awareness, and this is a way that we have even children as young as four start to develop breath awareness. And one of the things we do, people often ask me about buy-in for young kids, we find if we make the practices, if we make it clear how the practices will help them in real life situations, that they're more likely to buy in. It also helps if they're fun. So we talk to kids about how they can use breath awareness to calm them down when they're upset or to help them concentrate in school. The next thing we do is we do sensory images and we do sensory perception. So we work with the children and what they hear, see, taste, smell, and touch, and also where their body is in space. So this is also working with their vestibular and their proprioceptive system. So they know that when my arm is going up like this without even really looking at my arm, they know where their arm is. And we help them build awareness of that. 
After we work with awareness of body, we move to awareness of mind. And this little um, snow globe is one of the uh, one of the uh, tools I use that kids find very, very helpful when they're upset is to just turn a snow globe over and then turn it back down and ask them to really feel their breathing. Not think about it, but feel your breathing as you watch the snow settle and then see how they feel. Now that gives the breath, breath regulation some time to kick in and time help to help. And it also gives them a visual representation about how if we just give our thoughts and our emotions a little bit of time, they tend to settle and then we're able to see more clearly. So that's one of the exercises we do to help kids with the awareness of mind and learning to see more clearly. After we uh, work with awareness of ourselves, we pay attention to other people, which is also completely consistent and tracks the teachings. And we pay attention to other people, which for very young kids is a novel concept. To get young kids to go from paying attention to themselves to other people, that's a developmental step, and this is helpful in that. And then lastly, we pay attention to outer experience. We pay attention to everything. And with the paying attention to everything, we talk a lot about interconnection, interdependence, and service. We always send friendly wishes. And friendly wishes is the secular term for loving kindness. Uh, I found when I first started going into schools, I would talk about loving kindness. And kids, because they're such concrete thinkers, often didn't understand what that meant. Uh, but Gay Harwin, who you actually saw in the movie, who runs the UCLA Early Child Care program, said, hey, Susan, why don't you try hooking it in with friendship? So we turned the phrase into friendly wishes. And since that day, friendly wishes have become, become part of our program ever since. Now, I've been very fortunate to be involved in two different research studies. This first one is research on MAPS, which is Mindful Awareness Practices in Early Education. It's been a three-year research study over eight facilities uh, with, um, no, I'm sorry, over three facilities with eight different classrooms, eight different sets of classroom teachers. And I think we've... Um, I don't remember the exact number of kids, but it's someplace between 125 and 150 kids over three years. What we were really looking for is the effect of teaching mindfulness techniques in early education, and how did it, they affect behavioral regulation? And what effect did they have on children's uh, executive function? Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with executive function, executive function is one of the uh, educate or one of the attentional networks that we have, and it is how children plan and organize and, and inhibit themselves. Now, when I first heard about planning and organizing, I immediately got, went to planning and organizing a backpack, which my son could have really benefited from in his early years. And then I learned more about executive function and found that it also is planning and organizing sentence structure, planning and organizing how you're going to write a paper, planning and organizing sifting through information and prioritizing it. It's extremely important. Executive function is a higher predictor of school readiness than IQ. So the intervention comparison groups was we had an inner kids program in one group, and the uh, comparison group was free play. Now, the free play program, children had a choice of either being still, they could be painting, or they could be playing with dolls, or they could be playing checkers, or they could be running around the yard. But also remember that our mindful awareness programs are not still, are not completely still. In every one of our classes, we practice uh, contemplation or introspection while we're sitting still, while we're lying down, and while we're moving around. So um, those were the two comparison groups. The inner kids program met twice a week for eight weeks, an hour and a half per class. These are the second grade stores and the scores, and they're very interesting. The second grade scores came out uh, slightly different or maybe quite a bit different than the pre-K scores. And you'll see from here that the lower score, by the way, is an improvement in executive function. It's a little confusing. But you're going for the lower score is what we're trying for. And you can see that we certainly had a significant difference in executive function among the treatment group. But What's interesting about the second and third grade study is that the difference in executive function really kicked in on those children who were on the less regulated side of the scale, the kids who had more difficulties with planning, with organi organization, uh, kids who were sometimes more on the less regulated side of the attentional scale. Maybe some of them had an ADHD diagnosis. Uh, so we, sh we saw a remarkable difference in that population. We're not exactly sure why we didn't see such 
such a difference in the kids who were on the more regulated side. Um, it could be any, for any one of a number of things, possibly just because the class wasn't long enough, but possibly because we cannot push the more regulated kids in the same way we can push the less regulated kids in an environment where they're learning together. Because when you're practicing introspection with kids, you never push them for longer than they can comfortably handle it. So we're not quite sure why we have the difference, but we certainly do have a difference, and we were very pleased to see that sort of benefit. The pre-K uh, study was quite different. As you can see, the pre-K study, there was significant benefit in both groups with lower score uh, executive function. Um, the one on, the, on your right is the uh, intervention group, and the one on your left was the control group. So that's really quite a difference in executive function. Not a surprise, because at four-year-olds, the children's brain, brains are quite plastic. They're changing very quickly, and so it makes sense that this kind of an intervention could have a huge uh, help for them. Now, one last study, which is a very small study that's just coming out on stress, inflammation, and the metabolic syndrome in inner city children. This is a study that came out with uh, obese children and a caregiver, and the reports have not yet been formally uh, published, so I'm limited in what I can say here, but I have a few things I can say. The research question here was whether stress was related for the high, to the high prevalence of obesity and metabolic syndrome in inner city children. And we wanted to see what happened if we taught some of these kids mindfulness. The study design was 40 different dyads, a parent or a caregiver and a child, all chose to have some sort of help with, um, with uh, a lifestyle counseling. And then they were randomly uh, assigned to either an exercise group, a supervised exercise group, or a mindfulness group. Uh, the children were 9 to 12 years old. And... Um, and again, there were eight two-weekly groups uh, and counseling sessions. The intervention and comparison group, group, again, for the children's was a modified inner kids program. For the adults was a program that's highly researched. It's called MBE. It's a modified MBSR program for um, uh, specifically targeted for eating. Now, there's limitations on what I can present until the research is uh, formally published. However, we can fairly say that we are seeing benefit in both the mindfulness and the exercise group, and we're seeing comparable eff efficacy on the quality of life scores and the weight stabilization, stabilization in both groups. Now, this is not just right following the intervention. It's also two months afterwards. It's also 12 months afterwards. What this means is that for 12 months after a mindfulness, an eight-week mindfulness course, Children kept the weight off and their fitness scores remained comparable to children who had an exercise class for the same period of time. And uh, for those familiar with this population, uh, keeping weight off and having a higher fitness score is quite, quite difficult with young children at this time. So that is my pr presentation for today. I'd like to thank you for your, um, for your warm welcome and tell you how much I've enjoyed being here.